I'm going to feature two views, not that there aren't many more uh, of capital. There are lots of them. Uh, and the two views I'm looking at, one comes from Frank Nye. Do I hear a buzzing in here, by the way? Pardon? He's going to work on it. I'm going to talk over the buzz. Uh, two views. One comes from Frank Knight, uh, and it's called the stock flow model. Much about that as we get into the discussion. The other from Hayek, the stages of production model, which I'm sure you already heard uh, some about. I know you got some from Tom Woods uh, and from uh, Jeff Herbener uh, this morning. That's the two views. I could, and I'll make reference to a third view. Uh, I'll give it short shrift, though, and my third view is the Keynesian animal spirits model, which doesn't really deserve to be called a model. It's a sort of a sort of a denial, a denial that we can say much explicit at all uh, about uh, capital. So more about uh, that later. <clears throat> I'm going to start out with uh, what I call the many meanings of capital, and uh, you could get this, by the way, by reading. Uh, and I think it's the second volume of Bon Berg's work on capital, where he tells you about more meanings of capital than you ever thought existed. I'm going to narrow it down some. Uh, and again, just to give you the flavor, one of the reasons that capital theory is, is difficult is you can never quite figure out uh, which, which meaning of capital is in play. And so I'll, I'll try to make that clear as we go along. Uh, the first meeting I put up here, and, and these are all by way of saying this is not what I'm going to talk about. Uh, bank capital is listed second. These, these uh, different meanings come down from the top. Uh, bank capital sim simply is assets minus liability. It's a net work of, worth of the bank. And so when the regulators impose uh, uh, a capital requirement, uh, capital adequacy requirement on banks, they're talking about net assets. Uh, a second meaning, which is very prevalent, uh, is financial capital, which just refers to the way you fund an enterprise of cash or funds raised by stocks and bonds. And in fact, uh, that meaning is sometimes referred to as the capital structure, okay? But it, that's a term in finance that refers to stocks and bonds and cash and so on. Uh, and not to the structure of production as is used by the Austrians. So I want to make that distinction uh, as we go along. Uh, let's see if we've got a third one. Capital goods, you see this in, me in Mises, which just refers to plant and equipment, raw materials, semi-finished goods in the production process. And above that here is capitalized value, which is the present value of net future receipts. It corresponds to a company's operation, they could calculate or try to uh, present value of the future receipts. That's the capitalized value of a project or of the firm uh, for that matter. Uh, human capital, uh, we'll say something about that and conventionally in mainstream economics it, it means, well what I've written here, present value of skilled workers, future earnings. People have human capital when they go uh, get an education. They know something, supposedly, uh, and that's worth something to a firm, and that's the human capital that, uh, that they uh, buy when they hire you at a wage above uh, minimum wage, I guess, or above the market wage for unskilled labor. But in some uh, theories, uh, human capital refers to the, net, the present value of all, you know, of all work that the worker can undertake, whether it's skilled or unskilled. That's more of a Marxist view uh, of uh, human capital. Okay, now we're getting to the good ones, uh, the ones I'm going to focus on, and I've uh, uh, indicate that by underlining some terms here. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes you hear capital discussed in terms of the capital stock, okay, the stock of productive factors which yields a flow of consumer goods. This is the stock flow model that comes from Knight and before him, as we'll see, comes from John Bates Clark. Uh, it's a distinction here that's based strictly on 
the dimensionality, in other words, the stock of it, uh, is just the capital currently in existence, and the flow from it, which is measured uh, in a per year way, uh, is the flow of consumption goods, or as we'll see, sometimes the flow of services as opposed to uh, the stock, which is sometimes called the source, the source and the services. Well, more about that too. And I want to contrast that, most of my lecture is going to contrast that with capital structure, not in the finance sense, but in the sense of a temporal pattern of heterogeneous capital goods. All right, and I'm sure you've heard about this uh, already and you understand uh, that Austrian meaning uh, of capital, the capital structure. So these last two meetings, which are now the first two listed things in the list, are what we're going to focus on primarily today. Uh, and so I'll move on now from the many meanings of capital to something that we want to get a handle on, uh, and that's the measuring of capital. And the, the business of trying to measure capital, uh, either conceptually or actually, as in a, say, an econometric uh, study, is a big stumbling block. It's, it's what creates what's sometimes called the thorny issues of capital theory. Um, I've learned that when I read capital theory articles, if you sort of squint your eyes and look at the first two or three paragraphs, you may well see the term, the thorny issues of capital, <laughs> uh, coming up out of the page almost, because there are some thorny issues, and it has to do with measuring capital. If you take an Austrian view, uh, you get it right away uh, that capital, capital is heterogeneous, okay? Capital is heterogeneous. And uh, you'll even find that written on one of the Mises Institute's T-shirts, if that's the one you choose to wear, you can explain to the world that uh, capital is heterogeneous. But it's kind of a limp thing to say, capital is heterogeneous, and it certainly is. But uh, some Austrian economists, and I have in mind Ludwig Lachmann, would go further. He'd say capital is radically heterogeneous, okay? And you see by the italics uh, how much emphasis the radically get. Uh, and might make you wonder, well, all right, how radical is it? You know, how radical is it? And uh, Lachmann goes a long way uh, in that direction. Uh, I like to use a different uh, description. Uh, that I think has just a little more substance to it or is, is able to say something definitive, and that's to say that capital is dimensionally, dimensionally heterogeneous. Uh, but it'll take some explaining what I mean by that, but once I explain it, I hope you'll get it, you'll see what the issue is. And let's look at the other factors of production and we can see why capital is different as being dimensionally heterogeneous. Uh, here's a pop quiz, uh, and you have to fill in the blanks. And what you have to fill in is the units, the units. Uh, you see that the typical response when I say capital is heterogeneous, uh, the typical response is, yeah, so is labor, so is land. You know, what are you talking about? How, how is capital more heterogeneous than that? And the answer is it's dimensionally heterogeneous. In other words, if you were to fill this in, not all blank of labor are alike, what would you put in there? I hope it'd be worker hours, isn't that right? That's the way you measure work. Now, of course, I mean, it's heterogeneous because not all worker hours are alike, but at least we know the unit is worker hours. Right? Some are different than others. Look at the next one, not all what of land are alike. Well, it's got to be acres, or you could say acre years if you want to make it conformable with uh, worker hours, uh, and they're not all alike. So there's heterogeneity in land too. But now look at capital. Not all what of capital are alike. And I've learned in reading articles about capital to play pay close attention of what is used there. 
It gives you a hint about what kind of article is, what school of thought they're from, and what conclusions they're willing to draw. Now, look at that blank, and I'll show you what probably most commonly gets replaced there. Can anybody guess? Does anybody know? Look at the blank. Units. <laughs> units. Not all units of labor are alike. You know, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know, you have to realize a unit is not a unit. If, if, there's, if nothing else you write down in this period, write a unit is not a unit, and then try to convince your friends <laughs> that that's, uh, that's true, but it is. It, it's, uh, unit is a generic term for all the, other, all the actual units, like worker hours or acres or whatever. Uh, and a lot of the... Um, a lot of the work on capital theory, especially those aimed at the Austrian school, aimed to discredit the Austrian school, uh, use units as their unit. And in, in doing that, uh, they, they totally, totally corrupt their analysis because unit's not a unit, you need something else. So there are other things that you can use, and we find them in the literature. In fact, I've started making a catalog. You know, it's sort of interesting to see what other units people will use. Let's look at a few of them. Doses. Another dose of capital. Really? Try another. A chunk. And maybe closely related, I don't know, humps and capital. So I don't know about this. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm open-minded and I even Googled around to see if any of these would work. And so there are units. You've got your choice, pounds, gallons, quarts, yards, inches, and so on. Okay, Let's call it units. That doesn't work. What else have we got? Dose. How big a dose? Okay. Can't say. I don't think that's appropriate. There's a chunk. It looks like coal. That could be capital good, couldn't it? But a chunk it doesn't work for all. And hunk. <laughs> I don't get that one at all. You know, I just don't get it. Could be that could be the human capital. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to start uh, uh, with Frank Knight and Hayek because they they battled head to head over a period of years back in the 1930s, and uh, it was Knight. Uh, that argued in terms of a one good economy. He was trying to deal with capital. And so he had a one good economy. It was, it was all-purpose good. Uh, it, it was both the producer good and the consumer good. He called it a Crusonia plant. After Robinson Crusoe, I, I assume. So it's a Crusonia plant, and that's all there is. And you wonder how the market's going to handle it. But the Crusonia plant grows at some rate, 10% maybe. I've forgotten now what uh, growth rate that he chose. The Crusonia plant grows at 10%. And so if you just stay away from it, just hang back, you get 10% more Crusonia the next year and 10% more than that, or you might get hungry in the meantime. If you eat 10% of it every year, well, the next year you won't have any more than you had to start with. Right? So make your choice. Uh, the problem was that by using a one good economy, well, for one thing, you take the market out of play and you conflate the distinction between a growth rate and an interest rate. Uh, very knowledgeable capital theorists uh, can write and do write you know, the Crusonia plant grows at 10% a year, therefore the interest rate is 10%. No, no, that's the growth rate. That's not the interest rate. <laughs> the interest rate is determined by suppliers and demanders of credit in the market. And there is no credit, there is no market, because all you've got is a Crusonia plant. Uh, Hayek wrote some biting articles, one called The Mythology of Capital, where he just exposed the whole enterprise as a myth, that uh, 
about the Crusonia plant and about its ability to shed any light whatsoever on the interest rate or on uh, changes in the interest rate or on how markets deal with interest rate. It just wasn't there, okay? Now, I'm gonna change your pictures here. Uh, and yet this is the same debate that took place 30-odd uh, years later, right before and right after the turn of the century <clears throat> by, with John Bates Clark <clears throat> and Eugen von, von Bavere. Uh, and once again, they just line up perfectly almost uh, with the debate that followed uh, by uh, Knight and Hayek. Von Bavere, of course, picked up on Menger and he dealt with uh, the time element in terms of roundaboutness, that's translated from the German, whatever it is, you'll have to ask one of our German-speaking uh, participants. Uh, roundaboutness is, is not a very uh, descriptive term or it's not a very easy term to use and to defend, but nonetheless, if you understand clearly what Bon Bavert meant, and you have to pay attention in reading his volume two uh, to figure it out, uh, it's, it's one way of dealing with uh, the capital structure, the intertemporal arrangement of uh, goods, and goods and services in the production process. Uh, John Bates Clark, uh, however, uh, argued that the production time was really irrelevant, and he was the one that actually introduced uh, the stock flow uh, idea, and I'm going to turn to that next. Uh, and it goes like this. Uh, <clears throat> I, I call it black box capital theory. Uh, what does black box remind you of? What's a black box? Anybody know? Yeah, it comes, you know, you think about the airline having a black box. It's good. You've been paying attention to the news. You know what color the black box is? It's, it's orange, okay? It's orange. Uh, and it looks like this. There it is. Black box, flight recorder, do not open, okay? Uh, and actually, the, the, the term itself, black box, comes from engineering, and, and specifically uh, electrical or electronic engineering. And what a black box is, the blackness of the black box is you can't see through the cover. Dark, you can't see through it, it's dark, it's black, okay? So any complex, piece of equipment, typically a plug-and-play uh, unit, an electronic system with contents about which the user has no need to know. And, that, and that's why they call this a black box. Not because it's black, it's not, it's orange. But because the airlines, uh, they build an airplane, but they don't, they don't put together the electronics for a black box, they just order one. And it comes with a input cord and an output cord, and they plug it in, it's plug and play, and they leave it alone. That's, that's the black box, okay? And so it occurs to me that the Knightian theory of capital is black box capital theory. In other words, you're not telling you much about or anything about what's in the capital stock. So there is a capital stock, and uh, all we know about it is there's a little input funnel near the top because you have to maintain the capital, you got to put something in it. Uh, and there's an output pipe there at the bottom, that's where the flow of consumption goods comes from, okay? And then the uh, analogy is almost complete until we add do not open, okay? In other words, uh, Clark or Knight thought it was unnecessary to look in the black box to see what was actually going on in there. Uh, all they were concerned about is there is a stock of capital and it does provide a flow of goods and services. It's good enough, okay? They put that out of the way and, and, and don't try to talk about how markets influence what's going on inside the black box, okay? It remains inside there, okay. Now, start with a steady state economy. And you can imagine what that is. I've got a black box of a certain size. It's loaded with a stock of capital. Uh, and it does have an output. 
Now, it needs some maintenance, so part of the output, maybe not a very large part, but part of the output, has to be fed back in to the black box to maintain the capital, all right? So you have a flow from it, but part of that flow uh, goes into the capital stock. Let's see if we can get it going here. Okay, it's not going just like it's supposed to, but oh, there it goes, there it goes. So you got a flow from it, that's a flow of consumption goods, and you've got maintenance of capital. That's the little bit that goes back in to the black box, all right? Uh, and so says Clark, let's see, did I mess that up? Yeah. See what it did, I, I eliminated the flow and I also eliminated the maintenance. But now I've had to put the maintenance back on in order to be consistent with Clark's theory. I want you to understand Clark's theory. Uh, and so what I've got circled there or put in a square uh, is capital, okay? In other words, uh, according to Clark, the capital stock in this theory, includes maintenance as a technical detail. It's as a technical detail, you gotta keep maintaining the capital to keep it constant, to keep it from shrinking, okay? Uh, but that said, we can say that the capital stock is permanent. And one of the things I've learned, actually it was Jerry O'Driscoll, um, who wrote some of the early stuff in the research, during the resurgence of uh, the Austrian school back in the 70s, uh, tipped me off to the quotation marks that were around certain words in Clark. So he said the capital stock is permanent. And you can also look for other sort of qualifiers that let you know that Clark understood what those parentheses or what those uh, quotation marks meant. He says capital is permanent uh, in a sense. Well, what is a sense? Well, if you keep maintaining it, it's permanent. But that's considered a technological detail, where sometimes uh, he would write capital is permanent as it were. Capital is permanent, so to speak. You get the idea, okay? Uh, which all tells you it's not permanent. You know, if you, if you want it not to shrink, you better maintain it. Uh, and as a corollary to capital stock is permanent, what he gets is the permanent capital stock yields a perpetual income. Notice the perpetual is in quotation mark. And so the qualifications apply here too, in a sense, as it were, so to speak. All right? Uh, you think this might not get us very far, and that's what Hayek had in mind when he accused Knight and implicitly Clark uh, as trying to sell us a mythology uh, of capital. Okay. Now, the economy is a system of yielding uh, consumable output, yeah, uh, and the, the real purists, the purists of this theory, don't even like to use the term capital and consumption, because you might think of capital goods and consumption goods, okay? And no, it's, it's more rarefied than that. It's more uh, strict than that. Uh, it's rather seen as a, a system of sources, that's a capital, yielding services, okay, capital services. So, so that your toaster, for instance, you have at home, that's not really a consumer good. That's a capital good, and it yields the services of toasting your bread. Right? So uh, the, the whole notion of capital goods is, is wiped off the slate here, and we just get services that are emitted by uh, the sources. And one of the reasons that I use this, sources and services, is that in my last lecture, I think, in, on uh, Friday, I'm going to deal with uh, Hayek and Friedman. And Friedman encountering 
the Austrian theory of the business cycle, counters it with this language. In other words, he talks about sources and services and the, the market equilibrating those two magnitudes as a way of dealing with the Austrians. And, and you can see very easily that, oh, oh, I get it. He's got a Clark Knight version of capital. And that's why you can't see any of the Austrian stuff. In fact, Friedman is very upfront that he learned his capital theory from Frank Knight. Okay, and that's and he's going to stick with it. Uh, so that helps you see why Friedman has trouble seeing even what the Austrians are saying, let alone believing that they might be uh, correct. So I'll relabel that sources and flow of consumption is just services. Okay. Uh, Knight goes so far as to say there's really, think about it, there's really only one factor of production. There's just one. It's capital, all right? And sure enough, it is if you're, if you're this uh, strict, okay? So capital in the broad sense. For instance, land, well, that's just one kind of capital. Labor, and here I put an asterisk, because you have to conceive of it as human, human capital in the very radical sense, not just not just the discounted value of, of skills, but the discounted value of humanly ability to produce labor, okay? So uh, land, labor, and capital are all just capital in the broader sense of sources, or sources of services. That's the story, okay? Now, let's see if we can get an expanding economy to work. Uh, and it's rather peculiar that after saying that capital is permanent, then they allow us how, well, okay, if, if you actually beef it up, if you, if you feed more inputs back into capital, then it takes just to maintain it, then the capital stock will grow. And the way you do that is just making that, that stream bigger, even though it means making the flow of services less. So let's see if we can get that to work. Sort of lost its dynamics, but you can see uh, what that says, that, it, that if your flow of services is smaller and, and you're feeding more into the capital stock, uh, the capital stock grows. Okay, we got that. Let's try it the other way. A contracting economy, does that work? And here you get a shrinking of capital. And you're out of capital, okay? So that's the way it works. Now, one of the payoffs uh, for them, for Knight and Clark, is that they no longer have to worry about the time element in production. Okay, because you've got the sources and the services at the same time, okay? Uh, and how do, they, how do they understand that in terms of the real economy? Tom Woods talked about how we're dealing with a real economy, with real stuff out there. How do they deal with it? And here, say, what about production in the Clark Knight vision? Okay. Uh, and I get this from George Stigler, Chicago economist, very hardcore Chicagoite. Uh, and he actually wrote a dissertation on um, income and distribution theories. That's not quite the right, I'll have the title for you in a minute. Production and Distribution Theories in 1941. It was his uh, doctoral thesis. Uh, and uh, he argued in terms of a maturing forest. And here I sort of represent the forest just by uh, what a handful of trees there. Uh, there they are. Uh, once steady state is reached, this is what Clark says, this is consistent with Knight, and this is drawn directly from Stigler. Once a steady state is reached, production time is irrelevant. How so? Well, the trees have a linear maturity structure, it's actually log linear if you're a purist here. That's fine. Each period a sapling is set out and a mature tree is harvested. Okay, so let's uh, 
look at year one. There it is. Let's set out a sapling. There's our sapling. Okay. And then let's harvest the biggest tree there. There it is. Okay, now we've, okay, they're a little smaller now. We put out a little one and, and cut a big one. But hey, the next period, period two, these trees grow and they're just like they were the year before. Okay? So, and, and this is using uh, the Knightian kind of expression. It's the setting out that enables the harvesting. And you notice enable is in quotes. It's as if it enables the harvesting. Not that you couldn't set one out without harvesting, but it's as if it enables the harvesting. Setting out the sapling now produces the harvestable, uh, <laughs> I won't try that again, tree now, okay. So um, does it really? Produces? Is that what produces it? Well, it, as it were, so to speak, and so on. And therefore, production and consumption are simultaneous. So we don't have to worry about production time. It's simultaneous. Now, I wouldn't blame you if, if you had the view that Stigler, Stigler didn't say this. Stigler wouldn't write anything like that. Okay? He's George Stigler. He was a University of Chicago economist. All right? And yet, let me quote you. Oh, there's your qualifications, in a sense, as it were. Let me quote uh, out of Stigler's uh, dissertation and see what he says. He says, we can say that any one row of trees takes 50 years to mature, but since there is a constant output of timber forever, there is simply no point in saying it. All right? And that's Stigler, 1941, Production and Distribution Theories. Check it out uh, yourself. So this, this is the extent to which the Chicago School, Stigler and Friedman as well, uh, bought into the Knightian way of modeling uh, capital. Okay, a little summary slide here before I uh, press on with the Austrian ideas. Again, we've got Knight and Hayek. And, I just want to give you several aspects of the contrast so you can see how large a contrast it is. So with night, maintenance is a technical detail. With Hayek, maintenance is a matter of choice. Of course it is. Capital is permanent. No, capital is ever-changing uh, in the Austrian view. Capital is the only factor. Capital is unique and heterogeneous factor. Production time is irrelevant. And production time is a key variable in a macroeconomic system, in microeconomics too, uh, for that matter. So very much contrast here. And uh, according to Frank Knight, it's all about sources and services. According to Hayek, it's about a temporal capital structure and the sorts of consumption goods that that can create. It's about steady state equilibrium, as in the forest, it doesn't change. No, it's about dynamic market processes that uh, guide production decisions uh, in accordance with consumer preferences. A big difference. Now, let's see, before I start uh, talking about Minger's Law, and again, I know you've heard uh, some of this already, and so I'll take that into account as I go through it. <clears throat> but I want to suggest how you could uh, see the Austrian school as the moderates, okay? Some of you here might like to think of yourself as a moderate. I won't. I won't ask for a show of hands, okay? But some of you might think in terms of being a moderate. Uh, how could the Austrian school be characterized <coughs> that way? Well, <coughs> if you look at the Frank Knight view, uh, what you see is that, especially as adopted by people like Friedman or Stigler, uh, for that matter, is that 
they regard markets as so efficient that they don't have to worry about the fact that capital production takes time and there might be some uncertainty there and there has to be some entrepreneurial insight and the insight might not always be correct. They don't have to worry about that because the market will correct for that quickly enough that they can safely regard it uh, in discussing other issues such as what causes business cycles, why do you have boom bust and so on. Okay. That's pretty radical to, to believe that markets work so quickly that those capital markets just don't get meaningfully out of, out of whack. In fact, even the terminology that Friedman uses uh, suggests that. If you've read any of Friedman, uh, his first objection to the Austrians is, oh, they're just talking about first round effects. In other words, something starts to get out of Kelter. Well, the next thing that happens, it gets back into Kelter, okay? And you don't worry about those first round effects. It's corrected so quickly that it's just trivial to focus on something that happens to take you away from equilibrium, uh, even for one period. And Hayek recognizes, as the other Austrians do, that no, no, some, you know, with, with bad policies being undertaken, the economy can get out of Kelter sequentially over a number of periods uh, and, and can even be self-aggravating, uh, but not sustainable. Ultimately, you get a, a big adjustment. So the Austrians uh, make much more allowance for things like that happening than do uh, the Chicago School. So we're moderate with respect to the Chicago School. If you look at Keynes in the animal spirits business, and he used the term animal spirits three times in a page and a half, he tells you that he means it. Uh, and what he's saying essentially is that capital markets are so ill-behaved and they're so unresponsive to market forces that they're destabilizing and they make the economy dysfunctional. And the only thing to do is to adopt uh, socialized allocation of resources in the capital sector. Okay, he, he advocates the socialization of industry. That's in the Swan, Swan Song chapter 24. Well, that's pretty radical, all right? But look at the Austrians. They're right there in the middle. They're saying, yeah, things can get out of whack, especially if there are ill-conceived policies or politically motivated policies. Yeah, they can get out of whack, but the market is at work and it'll bring it back uh, eventually, okay? And if you don't have policies of that sort, if you don't have bad policies, then it'll pretty much uh, equilibrate but we need to pay attention to how that happens and make sure we're not interfering with it, all right? So the Austrians in that sense are, uh, are the moderates, okay? Hey, if you still want to think of yourself as radicals, okay, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll permit it, that having been said. Now, let's look at Minger's Law. I think you've heard this before, but uh, I want to pull it, take it a little further and bring it uh, closer up to date. Uh, the value of higher order goods derives from the value of the respective consumer goods. You know that. Uh, and Minger talked about goods of the first order, so I've stacked them from first order up just to get my orders lined up. It's arbitrary how many orders that you put there. This is just a pedagogical reckoning. And of course, by first order goods, what we mean is consumer goods. Okay, that's what consumers want. And so... Uh, in that kind of a system, we've got consumer goods and then we've got higher order goods, like that. Uh, and Minger's insight that's, that uh, broke company with the classical school and certainly with Marxist uh, ideas uh, is that while it's true that the production process starts at the higher order goods and goes to the lower order goods, how could it be otherwise? Time only runs one way. By the way, when I was at University of Virginia, we had a guest speaker 
who had a more general theory than the others. And uh, he says, well, let's assume just, just for the sake of argument that time runs both ways. You know, you're trying to, how does this work, you know? But he had the math, he had the math, you know, to show. And, and I, being a naive uh, PhD student, ask, well, what if time ran all six ways, you know? And it sent him back to the blackboard, you know? <laughs> he didn't get it. Time runs one way. <laughs> you have to start producing before you finish producing <laughs> in a particular process. But at, at the same time, valuation goes the other way, all right? So the, the, the higher order goods have their value because of the value associated with the consumption goods. And that's, that's what you've heard about, so I won't belabor it uh, in this lecture. Now, uh, that's not the only way to look at, the, look at the structure of production. I'll just tell you this, uh, if only to amuse you. Uh, bon Bavere, for instance, who was picking up on, on uh, Menger, somehow he chose to represent stages of production as concentric circles. He even said, think about the rings in a tree, you know, growth rings in a tree. And you can have one with a lot of rings or one with not many rings. One, the top one has roundabout processes with lots of, well, he wouldn't use stages of production. He used uh, maturity classes. Each, each ring is a maturity class. And the, the lower one has fewer rings, and fewer maturity classes, not as much roundaboutness. And he used just this to identify a poor country with a rich country. Well, okay, we get it. But it's certainly not an improvement over Menger. And uh, I'll uh, challenge you to use that diagram uh, to develop, say, an Austrian theory of the business cycle or something like that. Okay, it, it just didn't go anywhere. I, don't tell him, but I would almost agree with Walter Block that this graph shouldn't be used. <laughs> but the triangle is fine. Now, this is much more compatible with what Hayek did. In fact, you can see that. I can superimpose a page out of prices and production and show the goods of different orders that culminate in goods of the first order, which are consumption goods. Uh, and uh, you have orders of goods uh, going down the vertical axis as, as things are being produced. Uh, and you've got uh, the output of consumer goods on the vertical side. Uh, let's see if we can clean it up a little bit. I just eliminated Menger, but showing you that I'm staying with exactly the same conception. Uh, clean it up a little more maybe. Uh, and then you can sort of squint your eyes and see where this triangle came from. You know, it's just, if you just superimpose a triangle on that, you can see it. Now, clear back at uh, when I was at the University of Virginia, one thing that bothered me, because it bothered some of my professors, is that the time element, the production time, which really isn't a pure time element, it, it's, it's tied up with the value that's taking the time, measured in dollar years. But the time element, it shows coming down the vertical axis. Well, how odd is that? Just as a matter of pedagogy, it's not easy to get that idea. Now, let's see, time comes down the vertical axis. Oh, well, you know, what does it do when it hits the bottom? <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, <laughs> there must be some way to reformulate this where it's on the horizontal axis. There must be some way, and I worked at it. <laughs> 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 there it is, okay? And uh, now time goes on the horizontal axis. And I did that with, just to get it to line up with other graphs I had, and because it, it was just easier to sell in a seminar that you've got time running from left to right. But uh, in print somewhere, I can't tell you where, but Walter Block has actually credited me for changing the triangle in this way. <laughs> or maybe blaming me, I'm not sure, you know. But uh, that's the way it's, it's currently used, okay? 
And I can superimpose the triangle like that. And so you, you can see it just as a, as a pedagogical tool, you can use the little bars to indicate different stages, uh, or you can just put the triangle there. And you know that that, that refers to the different stages of production. <clears throat> it's just a pedagogical tool that works out fairly well. We could get rid of the bars, I think. Yeah, there they go. Now, you might say, well, this is just oversimplified. It's, way, it's just way too simple uh, to be serviceable or to be helpful. Well, I'd argue, A, that it's, it's not, because the key is that it incorporates a key variable, namely production time, as an endogenous variable, if I can talk in mainstream terms for a second, in the macroeconomic model, okay? The production time matters, it's a key variable. Uh, it, it's not something that you, that you add at the very end in terms of a lag structure. If you look at some of the older Keynesian uh, models, you do the whole model, it sort of all works at once, and then you superimpose a lag structure. Different things take different times to work, and you do that mainly empirically, but what seems to take a lot of time. Uh, this doesn't superimpose anything at the, at the last minute. It builds in to, at the ground floor the notion that production takes time. So uh, for that reason, it's, it's just, I like to say, since it's a triangle, I, I like to say it, it gives the Austrians a leg up on Keynes, okay? Uh, I got two legs of this triangle. Um, but secondly, if you really think it's too simple, then hey, let's go to Hayek 1941 to his pure theory of capital and we'll use the diagrams he has there. See if I've got them here. There. <laughs> so I could take a show of hands in the rest of this lecture which one do you want to use? <laughs> okay. that's, uh, that's Hayek's, that's directly out of prices and production. And I won't uh, explain just what it all means, partly because you wouldn't understand it, and partly because I can't explain it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I've read prices and production. Okay, let's go on now. Now what I'm going to do is crib from parts, at least, from my lecture on business cycles, so I can take just a little more time than I'll be able to take uh, in the next day or so to talk about the structure of production. But what I'm doing is using these same, uh, the, the same idea of a, a structure of production. Uh, and here we're saying capital-based macro disaggregates capital into temporally sequent stages, okay? Consumable output is produced by a sequence of stages of production, and the output of one stage feeding into the, as input to the next. The temporally defined stages are arrayed graphically from left to right, uh, and the output, see, not from top to bottom, from left to right, and the output of the final stage uh, constituting the consumable output. And so we can put those stages of production up here. They look like that. All right, uh, and I've shown here uh, an early stage investment. It's a product development, and you think about that guy. Looks like he knows what he's doing, but he also knows it's going to be a long time before something actually emerges as a consumer good that will pay for this kind of research. It's, it's, that's long-term stuff. Okay, it doesn't have to be a steel mill or uh, a coal mine to be early stage, it just has to be a long way from consumption and therefore interest rate sensitive. You can't afford to spend a lot of money on research unless it's gonna pay off big because it's gonna take a long time for it to pay off. Uh, and here, that's uh, late stage. Uh, maintaining inventory at retail, looks like the guy's pretty much got it knocked. He needs a few customers, but I guess they'll come. And notice though that these different stages of production pertain to the macroeconomy. It's the whole economy. Uh, it's, it's not that the, the product development guy is trying to make something this guy's selling in those bottles. Okay? Uh, it's the whole economy. And I, and I uh, point that out because 
there was a development back in the early 80s, 82, by Kidlin and Prescott. And they're for sort of Minnesota school, real business cycle types, but related because of that, at least once or twice removed from Chicago monetarism. Uh, they developed an idea that they introduced and made a big splash at the time called time to build. Time to build with hyphens, the time to build. And when I first saw that, I, was, I thought, well, this, this is going to be a move in the direction of Austrianism. Time to build, realizing that it does take t time to produce, and things can go wrong uh, as you're producing. Uh, but it turns out, though, that their time to build was strictly firm specific. In other words, the input of a firm to the output of that firm. That's time to build. And with the Austrian view, uh, production time uh, it, uh, allows goods and process to be handed off many times from one firm to the next. So it's more of a macro uh, context. Kidlin and Prescott didn't address that issue at all. It was all time to build uh, within the firm. Uh, they, or some people that, that referred to that article seem to believe that the, the Austrians were dead in the water now because if, if it's just a matter of time to build, uh, then business people can figure out where they are in the structure of production. If they know where they are in the structure of production, they can avoid responding to market signals that might otherwise have caused them to do the wrong things. Okay? But it, it turn, it's, it's simply not true that business firms know exactly where they are in the structure of production. In fact, they may be at several places. They may produce several different goods, and each are sold to... Uh, other firms that themselves are at different points in the structure of production. And the only way they can figure out what to produce, how much to produce, and how to price it is through the market. Okay, so it's, it's really market signals uh, that tells people uh, what the prices are, which then has some implication about where they are in the structure of production. But if those prices are being distorted by government policy, and then they get a distorted view of where they are. So uh, in times of, of, of all sorts of policies being pursued uh, that, that make the price system dysfunctional, they don't have any idea what to do, whether to produce more of something or less of something or shut down or uh, expand or whatever. And I try to make this point here. Uh, this is... Uh, an enterprise of some sort, I'm not sure what, but there it is. If you look down here, the main gate is in red. That's over there, and I'm sure at that main gate you'll see a little uh, little plaque that says, you are here, so you know how to get somewhere else. Okay, that, That's boilerplate, that's always there. You are here. But what I want to emphasize is what's missing. What's missing here? You won't see something else. I'll, I'll pull it up so you can see it. We are here, okay? You don't, you don't see the business firm telling you, where, here's where we are in the structure of production. No, they don't know where they are in the structure of production. They're responding to price signals like everybody else in the market, uh, which is influenced by interest rates, okay? And the magnitude of that influence depends on lots of things about where, the, where they are and where other firms are that they're selling output to. Uh, so you don't, don't look for that sign anywhere. Or when you, when you go on one of these uh, trips to an industry to look through and get a tour, take a, take a Xerox copy of the structure of production and ask everyone along the tour, where are you on this? <laughs> throw you out. You know, I don't know where you are. Okay. For pedagogical convenience, the capital structure is shown having five stages uh, with growth, the number of stages increase. Okay? Uh, you can think of each stage existing at every point in time. I mean, all these things are going on at once. But at the same time, you can think of goods pro proceeding through the stages of production. Uh, in fact, we can even show it if my dynamics will work for me. Like that. Didn't get the sound when we got the 
but we got the live in here. And uh, just, just to show you how old this is, this comes from Hayek, really. All I did was turn the triangle over, all right? So it comes from Hayek. It was introduced in 31, which is five years before the general theory. Uh, and uh, it was also the last year that Henry Ford produced the Model A. That shows you how old the, the theory is. Okay, so I, I say if you had PowerPoint, you could show how the Model A's were produced. With, and Henry Ford, if you know, he, he owned a lot of the stages of production. He owned iron ore deposits and mining, and he had a, a lot of them. So we ought to be able to produce some Model A Fords. So we'll see. Thirty-one Model A Roadsters. Okay, together the sequence form the Hayekian triangle, so we can use it without uh, identifying the stages. Watch the structure of production expand. This is just to say, as in the Knightian case, uh, it's possible that if you're more than maintaining the structure, it will grow. It won't necessarily change the interest rate, and it doesn't involve that, but it grows. Okay. More importantly, if you save more, that puts downward pressure on the interest rate. The triangle changes shapes because early stage stuff is more expensive. You have to, you have to pay more in terms of interest to carry it uh, through to uh, completion. And so in that case, um, reduce current consumption. You're saving means you're reducing your consumption. Uh, that frees up resources in the late stage and allows them to be used in the early stages. So resources flow from early stage, from late stage to early stage. And no, this does not require time travel. It's not time running backward. So let's see if we can't see that too. There it is. You get resources that, that you get the triangle adjusting in, in its shape. Uh, and then there's more investment total because more is saved, more is invested, and it's ranged uh, with uh, emphasis on the early stages. And so the, the triangle uh, the triangle will adjust. Let's see, I don't have that in here, but the triangle will grow more quickly. I'm gonna, I could go back and make it work, but I'm going to go on because I'm about out of time. So here, uh, let's look at the Knightian construction. Uh, increased savings, savings beyond the technical requirement, results in an increase in capital stock and a decrease in the flow of consumables with no implications about capital's temporal structure. You just don't worry about that. I know, one minute. Uh, <laughs> in the Hayekian construction, increased saving results in reallocation of resources among the stages of production. Here are the differential interest rates sensitivities are at work, okay? Just one more slide, I think. No, I do have it growing. So it grows faster because you've, add, you've added more uh, investment. I'm going by that clock back there. Okay, this is gonna be the last slide. We can clearly see the critical difference between Knight and Hayek. If we burn through the casing on the Knightian box, we see the Hayekian temporal structure of capital that allows for differential interest rate sensitivity and hence reveals the market mechanism that tailors production plans to intertemporal preferences. Let's burn through. There it is. That's what, the, that's what the Knightians and the Chicago people are missing, and it's a lot to miss. It uh, sort of closes off any possibility of a decent theory of the business cycle on the part of Chicago. Okay. Thank you much. <laughs>